on every major network. Uh, now, uh, I have some of the things that he has won, but uh, the, source that I, the source that I went through... <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm going to cut it short. <laughs> uh, in 1959... <laughs> That's cutting it short. I skipped 10 years. Uh, okay, well, he, did, he uh, conceived the idea, created, and wrote most of the Twilight Zones, two of which we saw tonight. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce <laughs> a cut short Rod Serling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll speak very briefly. Uh, commentative on what we've just seen. Can you hear me in the back there? I've got a lousy cold and I'm not projecting worth a damn. Uh, it would be a help to me if you turned on some house lights so I could look at some faces. I feel lonely up here. That, that's better. <laughs> much better. Oh, much better, much better. I didn't mean number one to put you down, Bob. It's just that I'm so humble. And, uh, <laughs> Two things struck me. I hadn't seen either of these shows in a number of years. They were produced in 1959 at a budget considerably less than we would take nowadays. Uh, perhaps some of the people in them were, were uh, familiar to you. Jimmy Daly now does one of the hospital shows, only in white hair. And uh, they cut me out of this picture, and you would have noted that I, too, have aged considerably in the past 12 years in the transpiring time here. But the things that most noticeably struck me were, number one, an aged quality to the film, and particularly in the first one, which I thought uh, left you in, in kind of an emotional lurch. Uh, <laughs> I, I had hoped at the time that it was Coleridge's willing suspension of disbelief, but I don't know how willing that suspension was now. But it points up, of course, one of the major problems of trying to do a 24-minute show and probe people and tell a legitimate story and tackle a, at least a reasonably mature theme. Also, I think it very definitively and clinically points out one of the major inbred problems of television, that however moving and however probing and incisive the drama, it cannot retain any, any consistent thread of legitimacy when after 12 or 13 minutes, out come 12 dancing rabbits with toilet paper. <laughs> It, it puts the creator, particularly the writer, in a tough emotional bind, though, because obviously Sanka Coffee here, as tasteless and offensive as those commercials were, uh, nonetheless paid the freight. And, you know, how do you predatorily bite that hand that feeds you consistently? So that, by way of a brief introduction to the films or postscript to the films, I'll entertain any questions you have, and uh, I'll try to paraphrase the question, should the well, rest of the audience not... We have a uh, microphone set up. You have microphones set up. On either right. side of the uh, ballroom. So if you could find your way to a mic. I'll sing a couple of Italian numbers while you're waiting. <laughs> uh, any questions? you want to come over here? We've got a couple of microphones set up, he said. <laughs> Mr. They're set up yes. on the SC campus, but you'll get to them. Yeah, here we have. Um, Mr. Sterling, what's the major difference from writing for the Twilight Zone and now writing for Night Gallery? Uh, not very much difference at all, except that in Twilight Zone I had total creative control, and in Night Gallery I have not a modicum of creative control. On Night Gallery I can get scripts rejected, I can be dictated to for rewrite, I have no say in cast. No say in director, no say in any of the production values. And in Twilight Zone, I worked hand in hand with the show from hour one of its shooting to when we put it to bed. That's the principal difference. Also, we could use themes with at least a, a modicum of social significance in Twilight Zone, in which Night Gallery we've shied pretty far away from. But in essence, thematically, the shows are quite similar. We deal in fantasy, science fiction, this kind of thing. One more question. Will you be using more... Where are you, young man? Right, oh, right side corner. There you are. Light's yeah. terrible. Uh, will you be using more outside authors? Very probably not. Uh, I have to write by contract half of the shows and the 
Universal Studios are selecting the other half. And we've only been asked to do 15-hour shows, and they've already purchased 18. And so at the moment, I don't think it's, you know, a very fertile ground. Uh, Mr. Sterling? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm on this side. <coughs> Sterling. Uh, You're just trying to confuse the old man, right? right. <laughs> okay. Okay, first of all, it's I want to tell you... gaslight on the, uh, on the UCLA campus. Go ahead. I want to tell you how much I enjoyed uh, Night Gallery series. Thank you. Uh, especially the episode on Tim Riley's bar. That was my favorite, too. <laughs> Interesting. Do you know, do you know, I guess every writer has a kind of continuing thread of preoccupation. And did you note the strange similar thread in Night Gallery to the show that you just saw here? Yes, that That's was the syndrome evident. of age. Literally, I don't mean that facetiously. This is the guy who's growing slightly older and wishes it were back to Knickers and Nickel Ice Cream. And that was a consistent and a persistent thread in Twilight Zone, and, and notably so, I think, in uh, Tim Riley's bar. Okay, I have two questions. The first, uh, I'd like to know if uh, Night Gallery is going to be a regular series next fall. Yeah, it's a weekly show starting late September, I think. <laughs> You, you make a, a small man feel five feet tall, you know that, uh, all of you young people? When they told me they were going to renew it, I didn't know whether to buy champagne or cut my wrist, to tell you the truth. It's a grind doing these things every week, but they do a reasonably good job of production. They're a very flashy, you know, scenic-oriented kind of studio. So I, I hope for some interesting things on it. Okay, I'd also like to, like to know uh, why there's such a... Uh, missing part of uh, talent in, uh, you know, in uh, television. Uh, I want to know if it's uh, that there just aren't talented people around or if uh, talent is suppressed uh, by, you know, sponsors or by, you know, producers. Uh, why are the programs so bad, you know, when there are good programs on the air? Well, I suppose one of the reasons that if indeed that's, you're so, that's sort of a beating your wife kind of question, when did you stop doing it? Uh, first, I have to, to answer, you know, in tacit form, I have to affirmatively say, yes, you're right, fella, yeah. the, the shows are all bad, when in truth I don't think that. I think there are some good, some adult, some fairly probing, and some very funny stuff on the air. I grant you that an awful lot of stuff is marshmallow and crap, and uh, I guess in part uh, that's because I suppose much of the audience prefers it that way. I choose to think for sociological and psychological reasons now that the audience is seeking escape. They get too goddamn much reality on the six o'clock news when the blood is no longer ketchup and the body count is no longer arithmetic and the screams are not soundtrack. And I got a feeling that the same phenomena we're seeing in Broadway now in which you see almost a total dearth of meaningful socially commentative drama, the same thing applies to television. They're looking for lightweight stuff that doesn't titillate them intellectually, but just lets them escape a little bit. That's one of the things I think is the cause of it. The other thing is that the networks are traditionally bloody timorous about doing anything new, and also they have a desperate habit of underestimating the intellectual content of an audience. They make an assumption that the mass audience has an IQ and negative figures, which of course is simply not true. There are an awful lot of very bright, terribly aware, and very so socially conscious people. I think the success of a show like All in the Family is commentative on that. But as to whether or not we suppress young writers or suppress new talent, I don't think this is active suppression. I think this is simply a case of uh, part of their lack of courage. They, they'd love to deal with that which they already know, which explains in part why you see such a cycle of sameness in the shows. If a Western successful, you'll see eight imitators and all the networks will hit the Western because they think that's solid. The same thing with their writers, their producers, and their directors. If these are known names, they naturally gravitate to them because they figure they're known quantities. But, do you, do you uh, think that'll happen in uh, science fiction? I'm sorry? Do you think that will happen in science fiction? or science Well, fiction there isn't like any science fiction on the air anymore, but if you mean science fiction well, like in Night printed Gallery page form, oh no, I think there's, that's the best, best avenue for young, young writing talent that there is. Uh, also, it's, it's reaching its own in terms of recognition. Science fiction is becoming an altogether legitimate art form and a very special socially conscious writing form. 
And I think you can see it in some of this stuff, the Vonnegut stuff, the Isaac Asimov stuff, the Arthur Clarke stuff, certainly. 2001, I think, has to be one of the 15 best films I've ever seen. Not just because it was, oh, you don't have to applaud for Christ's sakes, you've only got about 40 minutes and I didn't even write 2001. Uh, I mean that. No, please don't. I understand your enthusiasm for certain items. And I also caught the snickering at some of the meaningful lines that I had on my own show here. <laughs> which, you've got to believe me, young friends, 12 years ago had great significance. And now suddenly, I don't know what the hell happened to it. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, yes, over here. Um, I was wondering about something. 12 years ago, I was about 12 years old. And how Go ahead, rub it in, you smart-ass <laughs> kid. Go ahead. <laughs> And in the first, in the first uh, film, I got the feeling of the McCarthy era. Was that, was that part of what was behind your production of it? No, this was done in 1959, which was quite a bit after the McCarthy hysteria. But I would like to show you sometime some Studio Ones that we shot during the McCarthy time, which were at the time considered, you know, vastly courageous. There was stuff written by Reggie Rose which at the time we thought, God, Reggie, you're in trouble if they ever catch you. You look at it today and it's cartoon stuff. <laughs> but in a sense, really, it relates and terribly seriously and in a very jeopardizing kind of way of what kind of hell we went through in 1950 and 51. When literally you were damned frightened to put your name on anything, you know, that said that there are certain American flags that in the rain get wet. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of fear, literally. <laughs> Okay, uh, TV I'm by its sure. nature eats up a lot of uh, material. Do you think that by its nature is going to eat up all the material, or do you think that there is new talent and new writers that are going to come forward? Oh, yeah. I, I know this sounds euphemistic and perhaps even condescending, but I know of no good writing that ultimately doesn't get recognition. It just takes longer in some cases than other. I can't give you the formula how to get the stuff read or who to, who to send it to or, or what all. But if you are a talented writer, if you've got some creative style all of your own, by God, it gets recognition somehow through osmosis or something. And in terms of that we're running out of material, we'll never run out of material. There's a plethora of material. You know, what we're writing about is the world and everybody in it, and that won't end, at least hopefully not in our lifetime. Mr. Sterling. Yes, sir. Of all your writing credits, which stories are your own personal <laughs> favorites? Are, are you talking? Somebody yes, over there? Yes, I am. Uh, I like to, it's simple, it's an old-fashioned thing, I like to look at who I'm talking to, that's all. Yes, of all your writing credits, which stories are your personal favorites and which themes have you tried to communicate most consistency, consistently to the public at large? Well, first of all, I'll preface uh, in response to that question, and this is not phony humility. You judge good writing by its lasting quality, like good wine, if it ages well, then it deserves a sobriquet of at least a moderate greatness, and nothing I've written in my life, and that spanned 24 <coughs> professional years of writing, will ever be remembered 100 years hence. So I haven't reached that pinnacle of marvelous remembrance like Gibson or someone else who will be remembered. But in terms of the minor league stuff that I've done, which some, which some of it is timely and some of it is pretty cogent and some of it is pretty damn well written. But as I say, no, I'm, I mean that. I, I think it is. All right, so it is, and I, what the hell? I don't care. <laughs> For no honorarium, I'm going to argue with you for Christ's sakes? Okay. I, I have a feeling that Requiem was probably the most honest thing I'd done because I knew this story terribly well, and I based it on, a, on an individual who I knew, uh, a show called The Rack on the Steel Hour, which was a fairly definitive, in-depth study of the returning POW accused of collaboration with the enemy, was the second best, and the best screenplay ever did was Seven Days in May. And those are, that's it. <laughs> And some of the Twilight Zones were little jewels, though none of them, you know, were Pulitzer Prize winning items. They couldn't, you know, they simply couldn't be that. Which themes, which themes have you tried to... Age versus youth is one. The province of combat and war being another. I find that damned interesting, incidentally. You know, I, it, it, to me it simply points out in a classic way the passage of years. There was a time 20 years ago when somebody said, and now here is Rod Serling, who served in a demolition platoon in the Army paratroops in the Pacific for three years, and I kind of preened like uh, kind of a nice young rooster. 
And now I kind of look a little shamefaced about that. <laughs> no, truly, and I think it's, it's kind of definitive and, and terribly telling of the time we live in, when suddenly I can feel a little bit ashamed in terms of being in front of a college audience, uh, shamefaced about my military experience. But I note with interest Mr. Wayne, for example, has none of these compulsions and none of these compunctions. <laughs> Mr. Wayne, you know, he gets up on every public podium and he says, drive him, hit him, kill him, you know, knock off the dink, kill the gook, do this, do that. <laughs> and I think to myself, now wait a second, I think John Wayne is a pretty fair actor, I really do. But I question the credentials of a man who has fought three major wars in the back lot of Warner Brothers pictures. <laughs> uh, You know, where, where the, you know, where the most stunning possible jeopardy would be to be hit by a flying starlet or something like that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, about Storm and Summer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, where did it come from, and would you describe a little bit of the creative process that's involved? Uh, Storm and Summer was the question, and that was the Hallmark show that was repeated a couple of weeks ago, I guess, uh, which interestingly, interestingly enough won an Emmy as the best sh drama of the year, and Yusinov got an Emmy, and I didn't even get nominated, and I think there's anti-Semitism or something running around this town. Uh, it, it, it took root in my reading of the, what I found terribly divisive and very ugly, anti-Semitism on the part of the black and anti-black feeling on the part of Semites. Uh, what, what, you know, what have you, Jews, Jewish people. Uh, I felt terribly unnerved by this phenomena because I could never understand why two ethnic minorities could ever hate one another because they share so much. I'm not trying to make a sociological equation between the plight of the black in America and the Jew. Obviously, they cannot be equated. But there is a sameness in anguish and a sameness in, in a reaction to prejudice. And I felt that the, the desperate irony of this kind of anti-Semitism and this kind of anti-black feeling by two ethnic groups who had no business hating one another. And I tried to dramatize, you know, what has to be the meeting of all minds and all hearts. And I tried to take the most, you know, totally disparate people I could, an aged Orthodox Jew and a little embittered ghetto black kid. And I was not totally enamored with Ustinov's performance. He's a constantly skilled guy, don't get me wrong, but he's not Jewish. Uh, in the rehearsal, the first word he said was pastremai, and I knew then <laughs> we were in trouble. Uh, but he was so skilled that I think he carried it off by and large, but I wanted Zero Mostel or Sam Levine, who had a definite ethnic consciousness. You know, they understood the colloquialism of, of, of talking, speaking Jewish. Uh, but I thought, by and large, the show came off uh, pretty well. The, the little black boy, uh, Guy Dixon, I thought was just lovely. That, that's Ivan Dixon, a marvelous actor's son. And Ivan's an old friend, and I was delighted his boy had the, had the role. Do you have any say-so? Oh, I'm over here. <laughs> You're over there? Oh, yes. Do you Hi have there. any say-so in who portrays the parts of the characters? Uh, um, and who is cast? Uh -huh. Well, sometimes in my own show, I had total say so, with, of course, the approval of the network and the sponsor, which at times could get rough. Now, in the case of Hallmark, they have their own list of stars, so called, who they will permit you to cast, who they think are commercially feasible or exploitable. And in the case of Storm and Summer, they didn't like either Sam Levine or Zero Mostel because they didn't think they were universally known to a television audience. And they gave me the following names, <laughs> Ernest Borgnine to play the part, <laughs> and uh, uh, Melvin Douglas. Both awfully good actors, but both uniquely unfitted for this role. And this kind of playing catch with a sponsor reminds me of why Twilight Zone went on the air in the first place. There was a toilet paper manufacturer named Delcy Tissue, and an old guy in Nina, Wisconsin, who ran this toilet paper company, and he had been sponsoring Steve McQueen in Wanted Dead or Alive, which was a shoot 'em up you know, terribly black and white type western. And he loved it because it was very simple. It was kind of like a universal passion play in which morality was very identifiable and always won over the evil. And when the show went off and he was left in the lurch, he said, I want another popular, a sociable show. And uh, they offered him 
several shows, and he said, no, that they didn't fit his sponsor image. They didn't enhance it, keeping in mind that it was a toilet tissue. And the shows that he, the shows that he rejected, the first one was Black Saddle, and, uh, <laughs> and the second one was Rawhide. That was the other one. And that's how Twilight Zone got born. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this girl here was first, that lady right there. Why did Twilight Zone go off the air? I think it went off by, by mutual agreement. I was pretty fed up and tired with the show and the network had felt that it was time to change and it was on for five years, which is a long run for a show. My agents were terribly disturbed because in the old days, the agents got 10% off the top, you know, win, lose, or draw, and they had made considerable funds on this show and when it went off, you know, there went the old gravy train off the track. <laughs> but I was delighted because it was six in the morning till nine at night, five days a week, and then working writing all over the weekends. And I was on my way to a fast sanitarium there for a while. But I, I enjoyed those five years, and in truth, I enjoyed them a bit more than I enjoyed Night Gallery. It wasn't as polished, and you know, it wasn't really as professional, as is evidenced by that first show, which creaked along. And yet, oddly enough, of all the shows, 139, not got the most mail call, it's been reprinted in short story form in 17 languages, and is consistently drawing royalties as a piece of writing. And only not because I think now, as I see it, not because of its strange production validity, but because of validity of theme, however badly said. And the theme, I think, is quite timely. In defense of, you know, that borscht you just saw. Now you. Why today when I have less control? I've been meaning to ask them about that. <laughs> I think it's because I'm kind of irascible and I'm a perfectionist and I'm not very easy to live with in a production, on a set. Uh, I hate my stuff to be rewritten. I have the normal, you know, lack of humility of most writers when it comes to analyzing and dissecting their own work. By the time I turn in the finished draft, it's my baby and I don't want anybody to live to deliver it. So I think by virtue of the fact that they think I'm difficult, and indeed know I'm difficult, they would much prefer me sending in half the scripts and potchking with them as they see fit and then using other writers and let them handle the whole thing. I don't know why I thought of Twilight Zone. Uh, I guess mostly for a buck, I guess, because uh, I knew it would sell, ultimately, though it took me four years to peddle it. And I thought, you know, first of all, I think fantasy is the universal language. I think it's the most universal theme we have. Uh, it's not only the, the, the plaything of children, it's all adults. We all play the game. And I love the marvelous escape of fantasy. You know, a guy's on a burning building. There's no way to get off. So what does he do? He flies. <laughs> you know, there is simply no, no concern with nat natural law here. <laughs> and you let your mind go completely wild. You know, it's, I suppose it's like smoking weed. Uh, I don't know. I've never smoked weed, but... And I, I truly haven't. I've missed something, right? I, I see. I've just yeah, alienated 90% of the audience, for God's sake. <laughs> 99% of the audience, as Mike Kett says. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do I have any advice for anyone trying to break into what? Free freelancing? Screenwriting. No, I have no professional advice that I want to delve into here because it's very specific and it's a big can of worms, uh, except, no, I'd like to pass on that. Uh, I think the same criteria that apply to all good writing also apply to screenwriting if your question is a creative question, if you're concerned about how do you screenwrite. But on the other hand, if commercially you want to know how to break in, God, I, I don't know exactly how to tell you that in this brief time allotted, which is given getting briefer now. Do you have any relatives in NBC? Let's uh, try that for an opener. Mr. Surly? Yes, yes. Um, is there something... <laughs> Is there something in your life that, you know, made your mind go like it is? I mean, <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean it. Well, I when I was it. a young kid, my parents used to play jokes on me. Like when I'd come home from school, they'd moved. <laughs> and, uh, uh, no, no my mind doesn't really go that way. I didn't, I, didn't mean it, I didn't mean it like that. I mean, like, you know, a lot of the stories that you come up with, you know, they're really neat old stories, but, you know, they're kind of, you know, who would think of them, you know? I mean, like, is there something... 
Is there something? Is there something that happened to you? You know that. <laughs> It's not coming out the way it started. Do you ever uh, get hit in the mouth by a middle-aged man? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think that my predilection toward fantasy and science fiction and irony uh, stems from any, you know, vast childhood trauma at all. I mean, does uh, it reflect your personality, your stories? A ref say that again, would you? Are your stories a reflection of your personality? I think in part, all writing is in part, perhaps unconsciously or subconsciously, a reflection of a writer's personality. At least in truth, it's certainly a reflection of his views as to human values. God knows it's a reflection of his political thinking, for the most part. But as to what facet of his own flesh is, is, can be related to on that screen, I don't know. So you think that your, the main way you had to get things across, your ideas and your beliefs across, were through fantasy and science fiction? I didn't get that one. <laughs> Do you think that the, the best way you could get your ideas and beliefs across? No, no, not the best way is through science fiction. It's one way. But I think, for example, uh, I did a show on Night Gallery. You know, wait a minute, that was fantasy too. <laughs> one thing, for example, I hate hunting. I'll give you an example of how it works, how you trigger something. My wife and I were invited to neighbor's, a neighbor's house a, a few months ago, or several months ago. And we opened the door, and there is a rhino head on the wall. The ashtrays are elephant feet. Uh, there are ocelots hung on the wall. In the garage are elephants, uh, hippopotami, and God knows every other kind of poor bleeding animal with this glassy-eyed resignation to death nailed to the wall. And a little kid carries a little ocelot, the head through the room and says, where are we going to hang this one, Daddy? And something clicked. Uh, when I came back from the war, I made a a fairly severe promise. I would never ever again knowingly maim or hurt or indeed kill a living thing. And I've never hunted for that reason because first of all I don't have any interest in going to the stockyard and seeing them club the cows and I don't, I don't even like venison and anything that looks like a bird makes me barf. <laughs> so no, I'm not a vegetarian. I know, I realize the inconsistency of this. Anyway, so the point of this visit, social point, was that I wrote a script called Clean Kills and Other Trophies about a great white hunter who got his kicks, his jollies, from killing. And the irony of the piece at the end is that the, the best beast of all is finally nailed to the wall, and it's him. And that's the way you're, a, a political or a social thought, a, a preconception is dramatized and and, and put into dramatic form, that kind of thing. Thank you. That was, that was an interesting thing. I remember seeing that. And uh, <laughs> as it was leading up to the ending, I knew that was going to happen. And yeah. yet it, was no, still, it still got me. No it you see, the, the secret of that, Bob, I think, is that, that it, it matters not a whit in some cases that you know oh, ahead, exactly what the ending is. But if the ending is sufficiently bizarre and poetically just, you're still going to want to see exactly visually what they're going to do, particularly, you know, nailing a guy's head to a wall. How often have you seen Raymond Massey so nailed? <laughs> that kind of thing. Mr. Serling? Yes, sir. Oh, I'd like to ask you, in, in light of the, the sort of underlying sense of in, insanity that was in the two films we just saw, the insanity of the human race and possibly the its insanity of the universe, I'd like to ask you, and it's sort of a broad question, how you yourself cope? <laughs> oh, oh. I, well, first of all... It's, I, I, you, I understand that you're a boxer and and stuff like that. I can't, I, a bo boxer? I can't box worse shit. Did you say a boxer? <laughs> I didn't hear. Did you say you understood yeah. I was a boxer? Yeah, one time. Yeah, but like I was that. the only fighter who had to be carried both in and out of the ring, and I think that should be made mention of. This is when I was a kid, for Christ's sakes, before all of you were born. This is, I was 18 years old, and I'm 46, so figure it out. No, you're so I don't want to be nailed for that crime. No, 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 I'm joking. But how do I cope was the question, yeah. right? Yeah. Cope against what? Uh, the picture Cope you gave with what? The picture you gave in the first film uh, on the Maple Street and the human race slowly destroying itself gave sort of, a, let's say, a bad image. Your faith in mankind, if that reflects your attitude, it implies sort of not much faith. I'd like to know how, if that's how you feel, at, at least at times, 
or that guy who had to escape to Willoughby and all Willoughby was was death. Well, I have to answer that on two different levels because truly there are two totally different thematic approaches. The first one, I don't suggest that I am so hopelessly and totally resigned to the ultimate destruction of the human race that this is what motivates my writing. I submit that philosophically, if anything can be drawn from that piece, is that there are, are forms of violence which are simply prejudice and bias, naked hatred, which finds ultimately its, its, its projection in violence, which can be self-destructive. I don't suggest that, yes, this is what's going to happen to every Maple Street. I simply submit that this conceivably could be the end result of our mutual hatred. And I think we're seeing a lot of it today. As to the stop at Willoughby, I'm making a social comment about a specific group of people, guys who overlive. But do you have a difficult time knowing that, and knowing that that still persists, does that make it difficult for you to cope as a human being? No, because I guess in a strange way, I have a terribly, almost euphemistic, sanguine feeling about the human race. And the more I visit college campuses, and this is not condescending, and it's not Dutch uncling, it's quite sincere, I have an incredible sense of renewed faith that the next generation that comes is the best read, the most intellectually oriented, the most committed, the most caring group of people I've ever met in my life. And when they lowered the voting thing to 18, I felt absolutely ebullient that Jesus Christ, the elder cockers are going to get out and the thinkers are going to come in. Thank and you I, very and much. again, that's not an applause line. That's not the Ronald Reagan line where, okay, 30 seconds, pause for applause. I mean that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was wondering, I really like your voice, and I thought, like, you know, at the very beginning of the Twilight Zone? A big you, pardon? You, you know that little introduction you have, you know? Yeah, that? yeah. Yeah, yeah? Um, could, you <laughs> could you just sort of recite a little bit of it? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> no. I tell you, I've got a terrible cold, and I also have no memory, but it's, there's a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space. <laughs> what do you say? What's your turn? And as timeless as infinity? What? Where did I go wrong? <laughs> huh? Well, you get the general sense of it, don't you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mr. Serling. Over Am here. I against commercial television? No, not at all, unless I can, they can find a viable... Oh, well, you see, I feel as I did when they shot the robe the first time, when they showed the robe on television. Now, you don't necessarily have to be a Calvinist or a religious nut to accept the fact that there is a certain somber quality to the story of the crucifixion. And the first time that this thing is on the air, every 11 minutes, uh, you know, I don't know who's being crucified, Christ or Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> Because Arthur Godfrey's on the screen condescendingly patting some little kid's head and selling some shit called Axion. <laughs> and I truly, I thought, God damn it, I've been offended throughout my lifetime. I've been mostly offended by the treatment of the black American on television and in the old movies. I thought this was the most singularly ludicrous, total denigration of a, of a cultured and talented race as ever. And I thought nothing can offend me more than to watch Amos and Andy. And then finally it did, the night they showed the robe. And then finally Ford came back and redid it on ABC and didn't have a single commercial in the body of the show. Five minutes in front and five minutes at the end, true, but nothing to disturb the pattern or the thread of that thing. That's where I think commercials should fit totally unrelated and completely divorced from the body of the show because they simply cannot sustain a dramatic piece with an entity so totally foreign as a, as a soap, as a detergent. Pardon me? No, I don't think necessarily television is better, but there is one facet. I think the documentaries are, you know, vastly improved. They're much more courageous, <laughs> Agnew notwithstanding. Yes, sir. I'll get to you in a minute. Yeah. Uh, no, because this is a concession I make to my sensitivities. I don't watch commercials at all. I've only watched two commercials, that, and I watch consistently because I've developed this fantasy about two goddamn commercials. Uh, and I'll share with you for the first time uh, my fantasies about these commercials. One 
is a knight on a white stallion dressed in armor with his face covered with a plumed helmet and a long nine-foot pole, and he rides down a neighborhood street and spears people, lets them have it, and they turn white. And my fantasy is that at one some certain given point in time, this knight will ride to the camera, he will doff the helmet, it'll be George Wallace of Alabama. <laughs> and the second one, wow, the second one is a commercial, a guy on the ledge of a six-story building, and he jumps into an open convertible. And I, my fantasy there is on that unfortunate moment when he lands on a stick shift, uh, <laughs> then he'll know the real meaning of Hertz. That's the other <laughs> fantasy. But in truth... Those are about the only commercials I watch. Mr. Okay. Serling. Well, he had a question over here. Yes. Mr. Serling. Yes, sir. Uh, with the industry being in the state of limbo that it is today, what do you envision as being the future of the industry? I haven't the foggiest notion. I wish I did know. My guess is that ultimately cassettes, paid things that you can purchase and insert into the machine, are going to wreak a tremendous change. In, in what you're currently viewing. I think you're going to see a lot of full-length theater, major motion pictures. Uh, I think television commercially will probably evolve as a kind of a big spec thing, major sporting events, this kind of thing. But my guess is cassettes probably pose the most possibility of change of any of the technical advances that we've had. But from a programming point of view, I just don't know because this current year eludes me entirely. The network for the first time has deliberately knocked off programs which are successful, entrenched, and altogether popular. Shows like Beverly Hillbillies, which I for all my life thought, and this is not sour grapes knocking, I always thought it was a single line gag. And that once delivered of the joke, there's very damn little left. And yet, by God, the public ate it up. And the same thing went with that that awful show, Hee Haw, you know, which I think is some gigantic, vast, insane put on, that they're, 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 you know, they're just telling us something or something. But that has got to be, with the exception of This Is Your Life, the worst goddamn show I ever saw in my life. <laughs> and I watched that This Is Your Life the other night, and I tell you, you know what it reminds me of on, on the intellectual plane? If you've ever gone through a magazine counter and see all the, the confessional magazines and every one is Bobby Kennedy, uh, not Bobby Kennedy, is poor Jackie Kennedy, and it always says that terrible secret that Jackie cannot tell her children, or that awful night that Jackie barfed on the Finnish ambassador and cannot tell the story, <laughs> and this kind of thing. And you think, God help us, leave that poor gracious woman alone. You know, let her alone with that little right. Greek man and... Uh, <laughs> Let them open up a bottle of olives or whatever the deal is, you know, and leave her alone. And, and I feel that that same intellectual approach is taken by this is your life. Uh, you know, it's a deliberate pandering, an intrusion, a predatory invasion of privacy, and it's simply god-awful. Mr. Sterling? Mr. Sterling? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I'd like to know your feelings on uh, uh, con your contemporary writer, uh, Joseph Stefano and his now defunct Outer Limits. I thought, well, I don't know how many of the shows that Joe wrote himself, but I thought it was a pretty good show, uh, Outer Limits. I don't think it can be equated with Twilight Zone because it was a very different bag than what we did. They dealt very principally with outer space manifestations, monstrous people, which incidentally were damn well done. And I'm not making a value judgment or a comparative one of, of that show and mine. But they were, you know, it's kind of apples and grapefruit, kind of. Yeah, and one more question. I'd like to know... Uh, but he's a very talented man, Joe Di, St the Joe Di Stefano. Uh, that one um, half-hour Outer Limits, the name of it was Occurrence at Oak Creek Bridge. Uh, that wasn't Outer Limits. Oh, that wasn't Outer that Limits? That was a Twilight Zone. Oh. That was another show. Excuse me, I meant Twilight but Zone. But even I can't take a bow for it because that was a French film shot in France as part of an Ambrose Bierce trilogy as a feature film. We purchased 28 minutes of it and got a two-run network agreement to allow us to show it. And it was so stated. We didn't try to phony it up by suggesting we had done it. We ran their credits and indicated in the announcement, uh, as a matter of fact, I did on camera that we did not shoot this film. That was the best of the lot. Brilliant cinematic piece, shown at Cannes, shown at the Modern Museum. If you ever get a chance to see it, or next time I'm invited, I'll bring it. It's a gorgeous piece of work, it really is. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
<laughs> I'm invited. Oh, Thank boy. you. Right. Mr. Sir. But who are you? <laughs> Dennis Hopper, did you say? <laughs> Dennis Hopper, this is the question or the statement. Dennis Hopper went into the Twilight Zone where he was haunted by an old ghost. I remember the show vividly. It was called He's Alive. No, I thought it was one of the best written scripts completely pissed away by the performance of Dennis Hopper. I must tell you this in utter frankness, and I'll say it to Mr. Hopper as well. It was a most uncontrolled, undisciplined performance which took considerably more thespic talent than the young man had at the time. It needed a very restrained performance, and Dennis started to cry in real one, and there was simply emotionally no place to go. But this was the story of the kid who, who uh, aspired to be another Hitler, a rabble rouser. And the ghost who was feeding him the lines was indeed Adolf Hitler. That was the premise. And it was a corker of a script. It was one of those scripts where, unlike usually where the critic says, you know, it was a lousy script, but, you know, Gary Cooper saved it. This, I think, was a very good script, you know, literally damaged badly by a performance. Mr. Serling? Yes. I just wondered if you've ever met or talked to Ray Bradbury. Yeah, I know Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Very bright guy, and I will say one of the massive, incredible talents of our time. Uh, a, a poet and a very wise man. Uh, we are not the closest of friends for several personal reasons, but uh, this in no way changes my opinion of him as a major talent. Yes, sir. I, I asked you that. Oh, oh you asked I me asked that, you question that question for a reason. Because You're I, his daughter, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take that home to him. No, I heard him speak at a conference, and I was just very impressed with him. And thought he was a beautiful man, and you seem to share the same ideas. On we a lot do, of things. strangely enough, uniquely we share them. And Ray is a terribly good human being. You know, it's a very odd thing about him. You know, he know he won't drive a car, and he won't fly in an airplane. Yeah. His whole modus operandi, you know, our extraterrestrial light year ships that travel billions of miles to asteroids, <laughs> but Ray won't get off the Long Island trolley. <laughs> and I think that's marvelous. I, and you're quite right. He's a beautiful man, and, you know, with beautiful thoughts. They just don't extend to me, that's all. <laughs> yes, sir. They're going to continue to rerun Twilight Zone, I suppose, ad infinitum, ad absurdum, ad nauseum. <laughs> uh, I say ad nauseum because they cut the goddamn thing to bits with 18 local commercials. And there's a th it's not on in the L.A. area, I don't think, but I travel around the country and I see it frequently. Pardon me? Never as a new show, no. Coming back to the L.A. area? God, I don't know, but usually, you know, it sporadically shows up at odd times. Uh, screenplays, you mean? Will I be doing screenplays or what? Well, I'm doing this night gallery. Oh, after that? No, I don't think I'll ever probably do a series again, ever. Uh, well, you, you uh, are doing, or just finished doing The Man, the screenplay for The Man, didn't you? That's a TV movie, the Irving Wallace book on the first black president. And the only exciting thing about it is that James Earl Jones is doing it. And he's an exciting man, and, and I think he may save it, because the script I find slow. You know, I admit certain faults. We've got about, what, five more minutes? Mr. Serling? Yes, sir. I believe the question came over there. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I feel like I'm at Wimbledon watching Trebert versus Gonzalez here. I'd just like to know, what are a few of your favorite Twilight Zone episodes? What are your pet episodes? Well, up until tonight, the, the monsters are doing Maple Street was, but now I'm not so sure. Uh, a one with Burgess Meredith called Time Enough at Last, about a bank teller <laughs> breaks his glasses. I thought that was a lovely irony. Uh, a show we did with uh, Jack Warden called The Mighty Casey, about a robot left-handed baseball pitcher. <laughs> Uh, a show that Dick Matheson wrote called The Invaders with Agnes Moorhead about the little men. <laughs> Story about an ugly Italian butcher. Oh, that wasn't on Twilight Zone, was it? What about, what about the one that with the Marty. gremlin on that was the a airplane? Little joke. Yeah. What about the one with the gremlin on the wing of the airplane? Uh, that was in a, uh, written by a very good guy, now deceased, named Chuck Beaumont. 
and an interesting show. And, and another one that, uh, that we did called The Odyssey of Flight 33 about the jet that goes back in time. That was another good show, but so much for that. You're going to make me weep. No, he's, got a, he's got a question on I'll get him on the next shot. I know it, but you see they get up there, so they get a witness. That's a factor. Oh yes, you know what that was? Well, I'm doing one on Night Gallery, not dissimilar in theme, called The Messiah on Mott Street. But the young lady made reference to a marvelous Art Carney piece we did, the name of which totally eludes me, about a drunk who's a, a store Santa Claus, who finds a completely, you know, a bag of plenty which continues to throw out gifts. And Kearney, well, you talk about beautiful people. Art Kearney has got to be one of the stunning men that I've ever met. Apart from his vast talent is the fact that he's a dear guy. And the most predictably good performance, they're just a handful of guys who you never have to worry about, interpretively at least. Jack Warden is one, Marty Balsam is another, uh, Jack Klugman is another, uh, uh, who, uh, Art Kearney is another, and uh, oh God, he played in the, uh, Walter Matthau is another. I think these are the guys whose work. I can't paraphrase what the young lady is saying in praise of a given show, nor will I in humility try to repeat what you're saying, but that's dear of you to say it, and I respect it, because I love the show. I, I mean, I'm kind of a middle-aged man-child. Yeah, I, not in a Christmas motif, but the show that we're doing, that I'm about in the process of beginning now, called The Messiah on Mott Street, has a thematic similarity to this. In this case, it's the switch -o from Storm and Summer. It's a little Jewish kid and a big black truck driver. And I think it's a marvelous, marvelously interesting relationship between the two when the little Jewish kid thinks that the truck driver is the Messiah. And that's in the sense of the thing. You hate it, don't you? I knew you'd hate it. I shouldn't have brought it up. Mr. Serling? Yes, sir. Uh, for the first time, I see about 400 people who actually read science fiction are familiar with practically all the Twilight Zones. And I find this unusual. Because normally people, you mention science fiction and they give you a dirty look or they say, you must be kidding. And it, it's nice to see all these people who enjoy it. I would like to know, through the years, uh, TV he has tried to put on science fiction. The Twilight Zone was one, Outer Limits were another, there were a few bombs. And I think Star, besides Night Gallery, Star Trek was the last attempt at it, at, conven at actual conventional science fiction. Uh, why doesn't science fiction go over in the extent that you see a good show on, like Star Trek? It goes on two years, and then plop, Well, was it happens. two or three? Wasn't it three seasons? Possibly three. Well, I'll tell you, I don't know this for a fact, but I am told that Star Trek did not die on the vine by virtue of a lack of popular reaction. It died from an economic case of overweight. It was too damned expensive to do and derive a profit. And if you'll recall the show, it was beautifully, beautifully produced each week with an awful lot of hardware and a large cast. And the economics of television simply dictated that it leave by virtue of that. Now, and th this, this old saw of science fiction appealing only to a small coterie of intellectuals or non-intellectuals, whichever the case may be, is simply phony because 2001 is a case in point. One of the big grocers at Metro released this, this rather obscure film shot by a kid, I think, who originally went to UCLA. Equinox? THX, THX, something, something, something. Big, yeah, whatever the name is. Big, big box office smash. Very, very successful film. So this business of science fiction films appealing to a minute group is, is simply uh, phony. And a second question I had, uh, which is a little off the topic, but who's doing your voice on all the commercials? I don't know who that kid is, but uh, we're going to get him. We're going to get him. One of these days, we're going to get him. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Surly? Two more, and then we'll cut Mr. it. Mr. Surly? Yeah. Over here. Uh, well. How do I compare myself to Alfred Hitchcock? Oh, about 82 pounds, I would guess. Uh, 182. Uh, no, I, don't, I didn't fill the same function that Hitchcock did. He was relief on his show. He was funny. Uh, I was never funny. I was always surly and grim. <laughs> 
Oh, totally different usually than Hitchcock. Hitchcock rarely dealt in fantasy, though on occasion it did, but by and large these were horror stories and detective stories, murder stories, this kind of thing, with bizarre funny endings, with the use of irony. Uh, but, and and the, the similarity being in the surprise ending. The Hitchcock show often had surprise endings, much as we did. But Mr. that's Sirling. the only way. Huh? Yes. Excuse me. Does my memory serve me correct in the fact that I heard your voice do several cancer commercials? <laughs> I was just finishing this lettuce cigarette and it kind of <laughs> caught me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess the sense of that is what you're trying to say is right. to do as I say, not do as I do. Uh, I'm addicted, man. I got the monkey on my back, and its name is nicotine, and my child is, one of my kids is in this audience, and is probably hating every time I take a drag. Uh, and I wish to God I didn't have the habit. I swear to God. I've tried to kick it several times. I've kicked it several times. Oh, about <laughs> once every three weeks I kick it. During the lunch hour, usually. Uh, did but you ever think of joining Synanon? They have just celebrated their one year of non-smoking. I know, I visited Synanon a couple of weeks ago and they didn't let me smoke the entire afternoon I was there and it was a marvelous, refreshing feeling, but I don't think they'd take a guy who was trying to kick tobacco. Uh, yeah, they, they, they would. I beg to differ. Would you like to meet me outside? <laughs> You're a difficult guy. I quite understand. I can't defend this any more than I can defend doing commercials. Mr. Serling? Thank you. Mr. Serling? Yes, sir. Over here, well... Right. You went to a school that offered kind of a radical approach to education, at least Antioch, from at least Bob said in his brief introduction. And do you have any comment on what, that, on what effect that school had in your life? Or well, I went what to effect Antioch college had on your life? We and didn't choose to call it uh, radical at the time. We simply called it progressive. Uh, well, it is radical in the sense that it was the work-study program. It was a fine school, and I was very proud of it, and it aided me considerably. My wife was a graduate, my brother, older brother's a graduate. So, you know, we're kind of steeped in Antioch. It's changed a great deal, uh, but all colleges have changed and, and students have changed. Uh, we what's, what's the matter? You've been, you're Antiochians? Oh, I, you groaned, I, oh. Okay, <laughs> uh, we should uh, cut it on that. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and thank you, Mr. Sterling, very much. Thank you very much. Oh, that's fine.